Hello, and welcome to A Different Atheist Reads, A History of God by Karen Armstrong. I'm Christy Winters, and in this video I'm going to follow on from my last one where I set up Karen Armstrong's theological perspective and provide my own atheistic perspective as a counter to give you guys a little bit of a idea of where I'm going to be going for the rest of the video. Uh, before we start, just want to point out my orchid. Um, this is the plant I got Two years ago, I managed, managed to keep it alive, and not only is it alive, but it's thriving and blooming, so I thought I'd share it with you guys, a little bit of something in the background as well to brighten up the frame. Uh, so enjoy uh, the orchid if you like that sort of thing. All right, getting started. In the last video, we saw that Karen Armstrong's worldview, as I distilled it, was really founded in... Karen Armstrong's worldview is grounded in the notion of there being a reality of God, that no ex human expression of God can be ultimate, and that we need a, a real pluralism and tolerance for people's different religious experiences. In this video, I'm going to present my counter-arguments. Um, in terms of her claims about the reality of God, my response is going to be an atheistic position, which I will explain um, shortly. And on the idea that no human expression of God can be ultimate or definitive, I'm going to counter with this uh, problem with making empirical claims that cannot be tested uh, as problematic generally. In terms of pluralism, I don't really have any serious objections to the notion of tolerance um, and being tolerant of what people believe, that's fine. So I'm not really going to take that up because I don't have an objection to it. But it is part of Karen's theology, which is, sets her apart from other doctrines which say believe or die, or believe or you know, go in hell or whatever else, um, whether you believe in nihilism or if you believe in, in hell from a, a believer's point of view. So I wanted to set her up in that way to contrast her with other religious doctrine, but personally I don't have a problem with, with pluralism of beliefs, so I'm not going to really respond to that. But as we saw in the last video, Karen said that there is a reality of God, it's ineffable, it's indescribable, and it exceeds all human expression. So she re rejects this idea that God can be somehow put in like a conceptual box or even conceptualized in meaningful ways. And to this I, I just have to say in response, then I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm coming from uh, an atheistic critique, and atheism is best explained by the messianic mania. An atheist, or a theological non-cognitivist, is someone who doesn't believe in God simply because they can't make any sense of the idea of God. The reason I see the notion of God, or at the very least the Abrahamic notion of God, as being nonsensical is because properties which are ascribed to him seem to either be outright unintelligible or mutually contradictory. And this is a, a criticism of a lot of the attributes that people attribute to God, that when you kind of start to put these attributes together, they end up providing logically contradictory conclusions that simply cannot be. And I'll just quickly do an example that the messianic maniac mentions in his video, which is the notion that God exists beyond time and space. Another attribute of God that makes no sense to me is the claim that God is spaceless and timeless. To say that God can exist spacelessly and timelessly seems to me to be the same as saying that God can exist nowhere and never. If God created space-time of his own free will, then he must be capable of existing in the absence of space-time. That makes no sense to me. I don't know what it means for something to exist in the absence of space-time, or at the very least some kind of extension through some kind of dimension. And when Karen Armstrong says that God is ineffable and can't be understood, to me, I think at that point, conversation just breaks down. Because what, from an atheistic point of view, what you're doing is sort of using a few conceptual boxes. You have the conceptual box of reality, which we know a lot about through experimentation and the scientific method and, and our own experience. And we have this concept of God um, that has been used widely and by many different people to mean many different things over many different time periods. And you're saying that God and reality can exist on the same conceptual plane, but even though we can go farther into reality and make very precise statements and measurements and um, predictions th theoretically about the nature of reality and how it should behave, other than seeing the word God on this 
box, we are not allowed to get into the box. We can't open it up and look inside and see how the pieces fit, fit together the way that we do with reality, although you're attributing the same level of empirical weight to this sort of I was a conceptual box with the name God on it, um, opaque as it is and inaccessible as it is, and equating that with reality, which is not opaque and which we can, you know, investigate and test. So I understand that a lot of people do that because they don't feel like that there are the words to describe their experience. That's fine. But not being able to describe an ineffable experience is a very different empirical claim than saying I had an ineffable experience, therefore God, which is not me, but external to me and connected to me, is also ineffable. And I think that there's this tendency, perhaps, to slide from personal inability to express emotions through concepts and language, which is a barrier we all face, to making assertions about the nature of God based on your experience. That would be like me, you know, making projections of what the moon is like based on my experience. I mean, it just, it, we kind of allow this for God, but why? Um, and so I resist this notion that we could put God into a box um, and not have anything to say about it because I don't think then anything meaningful can come from it. So I think I've said enough about ichthyism um, and I want to get on to my, my other point, my other critique, um, that no human expression can be ultimate. So um, yeah, it might just be down to different valuing syst value systems, um, but you know, we saw from the last video that it was less important for Karen Armstrong that claims be logical or scientific and more important that they are effective. And I do care that, that ideas are logical and that claims about external reality are scientific because we have an agreed upon way of developing facts and knowledge and we use facts and knowledge to contain our own biases and our own desires to project things or only pick up things that confirm um, what we already believe. And this is a bias that we all experience, you know, theists, atheists alike. And as long as we're aware of it and we start to check ourselves and we question whether our conclusions are based on our biases or based on the uh, external facts at hand, then I think we're on a better path to being true. Uh, being not truth with a capital T, but being uh, having a value of being accurate in terms of what we the claims that we make. Uh, so, to to say that you can never have any expression of God because God is this ultimate thing that defies description. Again, this it comes down to I don't see how that's particularly helpful. Um, and I think even if you make claims that God is uh, ineffable and that human beings can't describe God because of his, his ultimate, you know, the, he is ultimate reality, we end up doing it anyway uh, because we are bound by language. We think in concepts and we think in language. Um, and so if I say God is ineffable, I'm still going to get an idea of God in my head that's probably based in my own experiences or other people's relating of their experiences. But if someone else is having a conversation with me and they have a completely different set of experiences, we're going to be talking at cross purposes. So as a social scientist, concepts and their definitions matter. And you don't have to have just one correct definition for concept. You can have 17 different definitions of God. Uh, just tell me which one you're applying at any one time. Hey, that's the 10 minute mark. So very briefly, I'm, I'm highly skeptical of any kind of claim that people make external to their own experience about reality that is put in a box in such a way that it can't be scrutinized or it cannot be there can't be common definitions provided that are checked against reality and checked against externals to ensure that two people are having a conversation about the same thing so um, it's not really atheistic, I guess, more epistemological, but I think they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, I hope you thought, thought this a little bit interesting, um, and in order to make sure I keep to time, I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.